Thank you, thank you very much. So good morning to everyone. My name is Pilar Montero and I am an intellectual property professor at the University of Alicante. I am the director of the IP master there and I am specialized in GIs and regular IP spray in those matters. It's a real pleasure for me to be here this morning moderating this panel in this excellent GIs conference dealing with all the single key topics on GIs legal regime as we have seen in the welcome session. I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers, to the European Commission, the GIAGRI and EUIPO for this exceptional event. I would like also to thank all the attendants of this panel and particularly those who join us from South America or, or Asia. Thank you for being awake for us. I hope you will enjoy and participate actively in this panel. We all know that GIs uh, have strong emotional and marketing power. They are an instrument linking people with a territory, and it's for that reason that they are frequent target of fraud. If we speak about Parmigiano Rellano, Bourgogne, Kashmir Pasmina, or tequila, mochila wayu, uh, whiskey, we will see Scott whiskey, we, will, we get closer to people. The Justinian DGS already included action against fraud in the wine sector. And in the 20, 12th century, in certain regions, the consequence of wine adulteration could even include the capital punishment. So we can see from the last EU GI study that GIs represent sales, a sales value of 70.76 billion of euros. And on the other hand, the value of infringing product represents 4.3 billion of euros. So with those numbers, we can easily see the significant and detriment caused by GI's infringement to producer and also to territories. This panel will deal with control and enforcement of GI's as a key element for the GI system effectiveness. Without those activities, GI's could lose their power and this could represent a big issue for producer and also, as we have seen, for the territories. It's a real honor for me to introduce you the speakers we have in this panel. Taking into account the main goal of the panel, we will have with us a representative of each of the main actors in those activities regarding GI's control and enforcement. We will see the producer point of view with Alan Park. Then we will focus on the national authorities point of view with Bartolomeo Philadelphia. And last but not least, we will go into the activities of the EU authorities, namely with the point of view of the EU EIPO observatory. And I think we are all looking forward to know more about the GI's view. In this regard, I think we could start with our first speaker. I would like to introduce you, Alan Park. Alan Park is the director of the Legal Affairs at Scots Whiskey Association the trade body of, for the Scots whiskey industry. Alan is a Scottish qualified lawyer and he and his team have a global role to protect Scots whiskey from misuse. Alan believes he's one of the luckiest lawyers in Scotland. Not only does he fight for the interests of the world's best spirit, he works in the most exciting area of intellectual property geographical indication. We can see that he's a passionate of geographical indication. Alan, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'll just uh, share my screen, which it's not letting me do. Well, I'm sorry, it's not letting me share my screen. If I could get some technical support to do that, that would be good. Hi, Hannah, and you do not need to share your screen. You can just um, go and on, on your slide, which are currently on the deck, to move forward. OK. So you can start your presentation. And if you want to go to the next slide, say ah, next slide, and the technician understood. will do it. Thank you. Thank you. It it just shows um, my lack of uh, technical expertise, everyone. Thank you very much. I'm old school lawyer, of course, not, not one of those 
modern, jazzy, technical types. Um, I just want to uh, firstly say uh, that as the UK uh, leaves uh, the European Union uh, out of the transition period this year, it's probably my last opportunity uh, this side of, of Christmas uh, to say a, a big thank you to DG Agri for all their help over many years with the Scotch Whiskey uh, Geographical uh, Indication. And I particularly want to, to, to shout out some uh, grateful thanks to Cara Imperial, uh, Francis Fay, Maria Yusko, and Luca Chanfoni. So thank you, uh, everyone, for your support um, over the years. Um, I think it's probably worthwhile uh, setting off uh, looking at, um, when we're looking at the controls and enforcement, it's worthwhile reminding ourselves of uh, the typical uh, GI uh, framework. Um, so for Scotch whisky, there is domestic law in, in the uh, form of the UK Scotch whisky regulations 2009. You then have your GI level protection through the relevant regulation. Uh, and sitting uh, behind that, um, you have your main details of the specification set out in what used to be called a technical file for spirit drinks. Now will be a product specification that's filed and checked with the European Commission. And then uh, finally, underpinning that is your more detailed verification regime, uh, which might be operated by an accredited body to check compliance or uh, an enforcement authority. In the case of Scotch Whiskey, it's an enforcement authority which checks from grain to glass uh, compliance with uh, that technical file. So that's not an untypical uh, example of um, a, a GI uh, legal framework. Of course, um, the problem which uh, Pilar introduced there uh, it relates principally to misuse uh, of the GI and why those controls uh, and enforcement uh, levels are there. Uh, direct misuse is, is the most obvious example of misuse. Um, where, uh, in this case, uh, a product described as Scotch whisky, uh, which was not Scotch whisky, was sold in the UK, but produced and exported from Spain. Um, that was removed following uh, criminal proceedings uh, in Spain. But direct misuse, uh, although not always easy to tackle, is certainly at the easiest level of misuse to tackle, where a product's actually described as, as the product under um, attack. However, um, there are a, a number of uh, other levels of, of misuse which become progressively harder to tackle. Uh, so I'll give you two brief examples. Uh, the product on your left, nowhere is it described as Scotch whisky, but there are plenty of Scottish indications of origin on it. So that's an example of indirect misuse uh, where um, the person uh, behind this product in South Africa was attempting to uh, pass the product off as Scotch whisky. So you have a Scottish name, Scottish tartan, Scottish uh, bagpiper. Um, more difficult to tackle because there's no direct use of the GI itself, uh, but uh, it may be a combination of GI laws or unfair competition uh, which you use to tackle that. The product on the right is an example of, of uh, misuse in the sense that it's unfair competition within the same category, in this case, the whiskey category. So um, where product standards are not being met, uh, you find your GI having to compete with other products within the same general category, which do not meet minimum uh, uh, standards in that market. Uh, so for the EU, um, single malt whiskey must be produced entirely from malt um, and uh, comply with the definition of whiskey, which requires cereals, minimum maturation, and so on. The product to the right was actually partly produced from seaweed. So um, you have a, an example there of a non-cereal produced product that's describing itself as a single malt whiskey. So that's unfair competition against single malt Scotch whiskey, that's uh, deceiving consumers, and it's damaging uh, the wider uh, whiskey category, all of which uh, uh, attacks um, the genuine products, particularly the GI category. Um, but even once we get past the issue of misuse, um, we are then faced with a number of challenges. So do we choose litigation or is it an administrative complaint? Now, with um, litigation, um, there, there's clear a downside. There is a, a great deal of cost uh, and time involved. Um, and uh, with an administrative complaint, there are a number of other uh, uh, downsides. You can't get an injunction uh, to stop sale of the product. You can't get an injunction regarding future conduct. Um, you can't get damages or illegal profit. Um, and you, of course, you, once the complaint is with enforcement authorities, you lose control of the outcome of that complaint. So there's significant downsides to an administrative 
uh, style of complaint as well. So it really depends on the market we're talking about, um, whether you choose one option over um, the other. Uh, the image on the screen relates to a raid in China against a fake production facility. China, very efficient at administrative complaints, so we litigate a lot less there. But in the EU, uh, I'm afraid to say uh, we don't have a lot of uh, happy examples of successful administrative complaints. And usually we have to find ourselves facing what should be a last resort rather than a first resort, um, which is uh, litigation. A second challenge is around uh, rights of representation. It frequently surprises me that um, despite the, the uh, gold standards of GI protection within the EU, that trade uh, bodies simply don't have uh, the requisite rights of representation to take action on behalf of their members, their producer members. So one example I can share with you is in, in Bulgaria, uh, where we found ourselves tackling a, a fake Scotch whisky, which had been on sale for some time. Um, and in attempting to, to tackle it, uh, we found ourselves faced with the court telling us that we had no rights of representation under either unfair competition law or to take uh, action for breach of the regulation which protects GIs because we had no economic interest in doing so and therefore we had to take action in the name of um, some of the uh, member companies uh, of the organisation. And the problem with that is that adds cost and complexity uh, to uh, controlling such an action. So rights of representation are a challenge uh, across uh, the EU. And even where we do have a right to representation, we don't necessarily have a right to uh, obtain damages or illegal profit as a trade association. A third challenge um, is around uh, enforcing our, our rights uh, be, beyond even having uh, the right of representation. Um, so for example, in some markets within the EU, uh, we can't take action for a direct breach of the regulation which protects our GI. We have to go through domestic law instead. In Austria, for example, trying to tackle the product on your screen, a fake scotch, which was produced from vodka and added flavoring. So a very clear example of a fake and easy to prove fake. We still find ourselves locked in litigation for 10 years to resolve that problem uh, within the EU uh, through the Austrian courts. And one of the difficulties we had was we couldn't enforce um, the regulation directly. We had to go through Austrian unfair competition law, which had its own uh, challenges. Um, the other uh, remedies available under trademark law only protected food, but not wine and spirit GIs because of a, an anomaly in the legislation. So again, challenges that we would not expect to find uh, within the EU. Uh, a fourth challenge is around proving fraud. So many uh, out there will recognize that, that food and drink products, um, you, the only way of proving the fraud is either through documentary um, evidence um, or through uh, analysis of the product. In the case of Scotch whisky, it's a chemical analysis to determine whether it matches um, the definition of Scotch whisky. Has it been matured, produced from cereals? Is there added alcohol, added illegal flavorings, and so on? Um, but the, the difficulty around uh, proving um, that expertise uh, can often be um, a, a challenge uh, simply because the national expertise for each individual food and drink GI product will lie in uh, its home country. So for expertise around the analysis of Scotch whisky, that clearly lies in Scotland. For Rioja, it will be Spain. For Cognac, it will be France. And yet many courts expect the laboratories in their local countries to provide that uh, analysis to show whether the product complies or not. And yet those national laboratories do not have the expertise required on both the production process involved for the product um, or the analytical parameters around what a genuine product looks like. The National Laboratory can carry out the tests, but interpreting and concluding uh, on the results uh, requires expertise beyond um, uh, the, the country in which the product uh, exists and is on sale. A fifth challenge uh, is uh, cross-border uh, challenges. So we frequently find the same brands on sale in different markets but the lack of coordination between national enforcement authorities means it's very difficult to tackle uh, the problem other than by the rights holder looking at it as a market by market challenge. Um, the horse meat scandal that some may remember a few years ago was a cross-border problem which did get some coordination between national enforcement authorities, but unless it's an issue which grabs political and media attention, uh, the rights holder tends to be on their own with those cross-border internal market problems which we'd like to see uh, a greater coordination between uh, enforcement authorities. Um, a sixth challenge um, 
which is linked to that uh, internal market problem is the EU external border. Um, obviously, the EU has a, a large range of EU uh, uh, food and drink standards, which are generally very high in global terms. The definition of whisky uh, in the EU uh, is, is an example uh, of that. Um, it's a very high standard. Any product not complying with that definition, regardless of the origin, cannot be sold in the EU as whisky. And, and that's, that's a great product standard to have because it ensures a level playing field uh, within the EU. But so much slips through the external border, it's then left to individual markets to tackle what ends up on sale, and not enough is being done at the border uh, to stop those goods getting into the market in the first place. And part of the problem is that food standards, like the definition of, of whiskey, um, is, is not an IP right, um, which benefits from the usual IP remedies, such as a customs application procedure. We cannot use um, the, the EU customs uh, regulation to seize uh, fake whiskey at the border, which might compete with genuine Scotch whiskey within the EU, because a product that fails to comply with the definition of whiskey is not a breach of an IP right, it's a product standard. And that's a significant problem for GIs competing with other products which don't meet those um, minimum uh, standards. That's um, uh, damage to, to sales within the same uh, competing uh, category. Uh, so to um, finish up uh, on an entirely irrelevant matter, um, in 2016, just over 15,000 bottles of Scotch whisky were exported to Antarctica. It's a mystery to me, given how sparsely populated that continent is. If anyone has an answer to that, um, uh, please uh, email me and uh, I'll look into it. But thank you for uh, listening. Thank you very much, Alan, for sharing your concern regarding the main challenge you face in your direct world regarding GI's infringement cases, particularly the problems uh, regarding domestic regulation and everything. I, I think it has been very instructive for all of us. And I need to say that even if UK leaves the European Union, I am, we are looking forward to see you in other events regarding GI's uh, protection. And now uh, we will move to our next speaker. Let me introduce now Bartolomeo Philadelphia. Bartolomeo Philadelphia is inspector and official at the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Forestry Policies of Italy since 2003, working on PDO, PGI, organic farming, wine sector issues. He has been coordinator and tutor for wine and spirit drink controls and on market controls of, uh, on PDO and PGI product. And he's resident advisor in Georgia since February 2019 for the twinning project establishing efficient protection and control system of geographical indication. Thank you very much, Bartolomeo. You have the floor. Bartolomeo, you are Can you, yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we do hear you now. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pilar, for this uh, extensive presentation of myself. <laughs> uh, first of all, I would like to give my special gratitude to the EU Commission, DG Agri, for this uh, great, great opportunity and uh, to all my colleagues. Uh, both speakers and participants to join this uh, this very very interesting panel. Panel. I'm going to speak on behalf of my administration, the ICQRF, which is an enforcement authority of the Italian Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Forestry Policy. Okay. okay and which has uh, um, a very great deal of responsibilities in dealing with GI controls, starting from official controls uh, through imposing monetary sanctions for GI infringements, uh, but also um, authorizing private and public control bodies for certificating uh, GI, GI product. Um, and authorizing PDO and PGI producers groups to carry out market controls together in cooperation with my enforcement authorities. And last but not least, to supervise the activities 
carried out by uh, control control bodies. So a very wide range of responsibilities, which uh, um, are devoted to control geographical indications at different levels, starting from domestic controls and um, uh, going uh, through mechanism of cooperation with 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 other member states enforcement authorities, but also through cooperation, a very strong cooperation with the, with the European Commission and several unit, uh, units of uh, PG Agri, and uh, also in the framework of bilateral agreements uh, established by uh, the EU and some third countries, also by setting up a direct cooperation with the enforcement authorities of some third countries by concluding memorandum of understanding for ensuring a sort of direct panel of cooperation and communication. And last but not least, by setting up several memorandum of understandings and cooperation uh, panels with some of the most important um, uh, internet marketplaces worldwide, such as eBay, Alibaba, Amazon, and so. In the in the field of market in, in the field sorry in the field of um, domestic controls, the ICQRF uh, can count on uh, two main tools to to counter administrative penalties. Uh, through two main um, legislation, the Wayne Act and the, and the legislative degree to counter uh, infringements against uh, um, any misuse, imitation, Im imitation, misleading information, and so on and so forth, against PDO and PGI agro foodstuffs and, and the wines, and also in case to um, tackle counterfeits, commercial frauds, food safety violations, we have also the possibility to um, perform our activities as a police, so through the criminal code. As regards the, um, some um, outcomes carried out in 2019 at the domestic level, we uh, carried out more than 30,000 controls for ensuring the quality and the uh, legal, marketed, legal marketing of PDO and PGI wines and agro, agro foodstuffs. As for the mechanisms of cooperation among member states, we are, of course, using uh, at best possible for us, <laughs> several legal tools regarding GI wines, GI agro food stuff, GI spirit drinks, GI aromated, ar aromatized wines, and most importantly, we um, through the main legal tool ensured by the official control regulation number 625 of 2017. The mechanism of cooperation regarding wines, spirit drinks, and agro foodstuffs are mainly based on um, the on two tools: the liaison authority, the la, the, la, the liaison um, mechanism of cooperation between member states and the ex officio authority, which are. Um, mainly based on an exchange of reporting among member states enforcement authorities. And since 2015, when my administration started working um, through such mechanisms, we have, we, have, we have been contacting all the 28 member states enforcement authorities in the European 
in the European Union, setting up a very efficient, a very efficient channel of cooperation. But of course, we have also used uh, and we have been using uh, the new, almost new <laughs> tool of uh, cooperation um, set out uh, in the framework of Regulation 6 to uh, 5, which means the AC, AAC system and the Food Fraud Network system. As regard the uh, cooperation with the EU Commission and third countries, we have been using since 2015 in a very extensive way the, the bilateral agreements which, at, which have been concluded by the European, uh, by the European Union uh, with several third countries. And I can ensure you that uh, we all can ensure a very effective protection of our GIs also by contacting such third countries authority in order to spread knowledge uh, in order to spread knowledge about GIs and to ensure a very effective protection for the EU GIs also abroad the EU borders okay let's move forward last but not least uh, we have also implemented uh, a very effective uh, uh, very effective channels of cooperation with some uh, of the most important uh, internet hosting providers uh, worldwide by simply using the existing U European Union regulations and most importantly uh, uh, to boost the use of the Directive 2000-31 on electronic commerce. So by effectively using the, this legal this legal tool to convince sorry ebay alibaba amazon and uh, some other uh, are, uh, are uh, coming, coming to take down any infringement regarding our geographical indication displayed on their platforms by using together together the european union legal uh, directive on e-commerce and the european union regulation on the, for the protection of geographical indication and the rate the success rate for this for those take down is almost equal to 99% this is a very a great example of success. This is a very success, successful story. As for uh, the outcome, just to give you an example, in um, almost six years, we have been able to eliminate cancel from the internet, take down from the uh, from the internet marketplaces uh, already mentioned more than 4,000 infringements. So we have dealt with more than 4,000 cases worldwide, not only in the European Union, by using together all the previously mentioned pro protection tools. And this is the key factor, to use everything to everyone. Just to... Uh, conclude some example of uh, misuses uh, and uh, counterfeits, um, but also um, uh, several illegal marketing of fake Parmesan, fake Gorgons, Chinese Parmesan, <laughs> Chinese Gorgonzola, <laughs> fake balsamic uh, vinegar of uh, uh, Modena, and so on, and, and the <laughs> just to give you some very uh, pivotal example, examples on our countering uh, actions. Some, for example, some uh, a fake Prosecco um, marketed uh, on tap, 
which uh, which which are uh, which is a clear example of illegal marketing of uh, this very very delicious and important GI wine in Italy. And most importantly, for example, we have also uh, performed a very huge and extensive uh, uh, action, a control action to counter the most uh, damaging uh, um, phenomena of uh, um, wine of uh, wine kit wine kit market, which uh, were seriously the damaging our EU GI wines, and this is the <laughs> and, 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 and uh, this is the most important advertisement uh, we can provide to all the market uh, sellers. So, to conclude, what are the lessons learned and uh, possible suggestions for uh, for all, all for all of you, uh, based on our successful experience? First, investing in your, your own human resources is the key factor. Please promote, promote the knowledge for your uh, human resources in terms of uh, trainings, in terms of webinars, in, term, in terms of working experience, searching for more and more innovative GI protection process uh, is fundamental, which means to use each and every protection tool at your disposal third cooperating with e-commerce marketplaces worldwide greatly expands protection and at the same time reduces the associated costs for controls because checking infringement online costs almost zero euro zero euro no missions to, to carry out on the on the on the spot at very early stage of uh, of control. Just a laptop and a, a very good inspector's hunch. This is very very necessary. <laughs> and last, in enhancing cooperation among member states and third countries, at the same time ensures a better protection of. Uh, uh, geographical indications, but also helps to spread knowledge of GIs among European and third country citizens. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bartolomeo, for your great and very illustrative explanation regarding the different activities of national authorities in GIs uh, enforcement procedures and also uh, for, for sharing with us your main concern and your interesting conclusion in this regard. I think it has been very useful for all of us. And now let's move to our last speaker this, uh, in this panel. It's my pleasure to introduce you now, Nicole Semrisky. Nicole works for the EIPO since 2000 in different departments as Boards of Appeal and Quality Department. Since 2012, she's working for the observatory and there she's part of the IP enforcement portal team where she is responsible for the user management and training. She's also the data protection coordinator for her department. So please, Nicole, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. Thank you uh, for the presentation. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I want to thank again also DG Agri for counting me in for this. And I'm very glad to, to present uh, the IP enforcement portal and its role in, uh, in all this. So um, I'd like to start my presentation on the challenges uh, in general that we face with IPR enforcement. Uh, the studies of the observatory have shown that uh, out of all the products imported into the EU, 6.8% of all products are counterfeit, are fakes. Customs and managed to inspect, if we're positive and optimistic, maybe 1% uh, of, of what's shipped it in. All the rest floods the internal market, and, it's, uh, and it is uh, the role of the uh, market surveillance authorities and the police forces, the internal market forces, to look out for them. So what we need to do is we need to cooperate as much as we can with them. We need to raise awareness, and, uh, and if we look at the figures that interested us, if we look at the... Uh, our tickets infringing IPRs detained at the border in 2017, 
25% of what was detained was actually food stuff. So very closely related to GI, GIs. It, in 2018, it was 5%. Now the question is, was it less products or just less products spotted? And if we look at the ratio of, on the legal basis on which uh, the, the IPR infringement happened, uh, as you can imagine, most of it is trademarks, the role of GIs was only 0.11%. And as Bartolomeo said, uh, we need to look in all to the, the legal means to stop uh, the, the fakes. And in this case, I want to uh, refer back to 608 2013 to the customs regulation. Alan also mentioned it. He mentioned a lot of the issues that there are. But um, filing in customs application function is important, and raising awareness is uh, in the internal market forces is uh, important, in particular for GIs. Um, the reply of UIPO and the Observatory on Infringements of IPR Rights um, was the IP Enforcement Portal, IPEP in short. Uh, the IP Enforcement Portal is a tool that was created to put in together uh, rights holders with uh, enforcement authorities. Uh, rights holders have an account, can have an account, and uh, they enter the product information, uh, they enter contact information, the IPR information. Enforcers have a search bar and they can look for uh, company names, brands, products, GIs, they can make a search and they get hits. Um, and this uh, concerns also geographic indications. So if you look at the slide, what happens here is that uh, enforcers look for a keyword and then get hits. And the search is launched in all different databases, obviously in trademarks and designs. It searches in the account information that was uploaded by uh, the rights holders but it looks also into the databases of DG Agri on geographic indications. Very soon being replaced uh, by, by GI, which, which entered live today, and edited production today. Um, but basically it is the same result as we would see in the minute. So the search results on GIs also come up. Um, most important for enforcement authorities obviously is who to contact. And in this sense, uh, uh, contact points of the producer groups can be entered uh, for the different member states. Maybe it's one contact point that covers all EU member states, or maybe they have specialized lawyers in different member states, depends on the producer group and how big it is. But what is more important, we need to help enforcers to know who they have to contact. Um, if it's a legal person, a technical person, what languages can we address this person on? Um, and as I mentioned before, right holders can upload all the different IPRs they have to protect their products. They can also indicate what geographic indication uh, protects their product. I have just uploaded the example of Parmigiano. As you can see, uh, the information is taken from the various uh, databases of DG Agri. Very soon it will be from GI View, and the information is out there for police and customs and can be linked to the product information. The product information entered is the obvious. Uh, it's indication of where do I produce. I produce the production obviously for our EU GIs is inside the EU. Um, our distribution routes, our uh, warehouses, all this uh, information that will help uh, enforcers to tackle um, 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 the uh, IPR infringement. Um, I want to quickly say that uh, the right holders decide with which, with which authority they want to share their information. As it is very sensitive information, uh, we have right now about 70 authorities accessing the tool of the various EU member states. And uh, the right holder decides, or the producer group decides, with whom, uh, to whom he opens this detailed product information. Um, of course, if the product information is entered, the IPRs are uploaded, the contact information is entered, Filing a customs application is very easy. It can be done electronically through the tool. As from September next year onwards, it will have to be electronically from this tool or from the alternative for 22 member states and alternatively for, for uh, the five member states who have their own AFA filing tools. But what will happen is that uh, AFAs will be completely electronic. And as it's pointed out, producer group can file a customs application for action based on a GI. This is absolutely possible and it can be done already through the IP enforcement portal. And the IP enforcement portal generates these alphas in all the languages, so they are generated in all the languages and reach uh, all the customs authorities. Um, 
I also want to mention, I don't have it on the slide, but of course the IP enforcement portal is all about exchange of information between rights holders and enforcement authorities. So rights holders have the possibility of sending alerts uh, to also to internal market forces, because of course as, cust uh, AFAS, uh, customs applications functions are for customs. So there is a way of also raising awareness with internal market forces and market surveillance authorities on uh, the same information contained in the AFA, so contact information, product information, IPRs. Of course, if we know about a, a certain trend where fakes or counterfeits are spotted, um, we can also highlight this to them. This is a way of, 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 of raising awareness to them. And the same happens also for web pages selling infringement, like Bartolomeo mentioned. Of course, uh, big producer groups have their own scrapping, scrapping systems and look for it, but smaller producer group might find it helpful to have a way to send the alert out to the enforcement authorities, uh, alerting on a web page selling uh, uh, counterfeit IPR uh, uh, GIs. And uh, what I wanted to say is that um, uh, Europol is always in copy of these alerts. In short, the use of the tool is, is, is free of charge. Uh, Euro, uh, the EUIPO supports this tool fully. We undergo audits to ensure security and it's multilingual. Uh, you can enter the information in your mother tongue and the enforcer on the other side can view the information in his own language. Um, of course, uh, in what concerns GIs, both producer groups or national authorities who represent those producer groups can request an account in the IP enforcement portal. It can be done uh, very easily by just contacting the IP enforcement portal at uipo.uba.eu. Uh, um, we undergo a strict protocol to ensure that uh, the person contacted, contacting us is really the rights holder. In the case of producer groups, it's the national authorities who will validate with us that it's actually the uh, producer group that is contacting us. So we have a protocol in place to ensure that this uh, happens. Uh, but now with the uh, GI view, we go even a step ahead. So as you all know, or I assume you know that uh, as of today, GI view uh, is entered into production uh, where all the GIs uh, that are recorded in the different databases of DG Agri uh, can be searched and can be found. And uh, if you are logged in and you look into your information and you record the uh, your country authority and your producer group, um, um, if, if, uh, if the producer group is identified as representative very soon, there will be a little button to request an account and access to the IP enforcement portal. So we won't need the, the uh, country authorities to authenticate uh, the producer group. If it comes through GI view, uh, will we automatically know that this is the legitimate producer group and we will start the protocols to giving them access. In any case, any question that you may have on my presentation, um, uh, feel free to contact me. Um, and uh, with this, I finish my 10 minutes presentation. I hope I have stick to time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicole, for your great uh, introduction to the latest activities of the IIP, EIPO Observatory. I would like to uh, take advantage of this opportunity to congratulate you and the observatory for your great efforts regarding IPR enforcement, which I think is really very important. And now I think we have uh, time. I would like to thank all the speakers because you have respected the time very, very well and you make my task very easy. So we have now time for different questions. I can see that we have uh, some questions from the floor. I will read it for you. Uh, okay, so we have first a question for uh, Alan, I think, because it's, the question is, it is GI Scott Whiskey protected by public entities or private entities? How is uh, in your IP law provided? When expire the protection of a GI in UK? So, Alan, if you want to answer, uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, Pilar. Um, okay, I'll, I'll take each bit of that question. So, the Scotch Whiskey Association is the principal enforcer of uh, the rights to the Scotch Whiskey GI, and we are a producer organisation. So, what that means is we're a, a private trade association funded by um, the producers of Scotch whisky to take action around the world uh, to stop misuse of the GI. Um, so uh, 
but we also work very closely with um, other enforcement authorities where we can, and particularly in the UK with uh, both DEFRA, our Ministry of Agriculture in the UK, and also with uh, Revenue and Customs, which carries out the verification scheme to ensure compliance with um, the specifications for Scotch whisky. So it's a partnership, but when it comes to litigating uh, around the world, um, then that uh, is the, the job of the private organisation, which is the Scotch Whisky Association. Um, on the other point, um, UK GIs, uh, which are currently protected in EU schemes, um, will remain as UK GIs under a new UK scheme, which will have its own GI register from the 1st of January 2021. Um, now, the expectation uh, is that all EU GIs currently protected uh, in the UK through EU schemes will uh, get that continuous protection through the UK uh, GI register. Uh, negotiations are still ongoing on that, but under the withdrawal agreement uh, agreed between the UK and the EU, um, there should be continued protection for EU uh, GIs within the UK. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alan, for, for this great answer. We have another question from the floor. And I, I don't know if it's perhaps more to Bartolomeo because of their uh, speech. Who concludes the uh, memorandum of, of understanding with the platform, Salibaba Amazon? Or if you can tell us something about that. Thank you so much. Can you okay. unmute? Okay. okay. Can you hear me now? That's perfect. Okay. As said, the ICQRF is a department of the Italian Ministry of Agricultural, Food and Forestry and Forestry Policies. And as uh, one of the three main uh, uh, MIPAF department, uh, the ICQRF is uh, absolutely responsible to uh, conclude memorandum of understandings and to uh, act as a sort of uh, sub-legal entity Inside, within the framework, the legal framework of the of the uh, IPAF. So the ICQ RF. Just to give um, an, an a definite uh, final answer, uh, concluded the memorandum of understanding. Not only with eBay, Alibaba, and Amazon, but also with the other enforcement authorities of some, of some third countries like the US TTP and the enforcement uh, authority of Moldovan Re Republic. The last one was uh, with uh, uh, the enforcement authority of the Kingdom of Jordan and so on and so forth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bartolomeo, for your clear uh, answers. Perhaps you can uh, see. I can. I would like to ask some question, uh, if I may, to Nicole regarding the presentation. Uh, as uh, we have seen all the activities of the UIPO uh, Observatory in this regard, I would like to ask her if a custom application for action uh, could be based only on a geographical indication or not. And perhaps if you can also tell us something regarding the border protection in, in this regard. Thank you so much, Nicole. Uh, yes, uh, by all means, um, you, can, you can base a, a customs obligation function on a GI exclusively. In fact, uh, if we look at, at what happens now with Brexit, it, it looks like for Northern Ireland, there will be a certain GIs that will be still be under the scheme of Regulation 68 2013. So it's, it's quite interesting. Yes, you can buy Sanafa on a GI and it can be fired by, by the producer group that, that, uh, that is representing the GI. And, uh, and as we say, I mean, have you seen us on the slides before, uh, border, uh, border uh, action, uh, action at the border based on GIs is absolutely symbolic, not even symbolic, it's, it's absolute minimum. So, so um, 
I think a lot of work needs to be done in raising awareness uh, on trainings on the enforcer side and uh, and also through through tools um, like they're sending alerts and, 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 and filing AFAS. I think uh, the more um, also this part of, of the whole picture, the IPR infringement uh, is part of the of this general picture of of of, of uh, fighting the climate deficits, and we we have to raise awareness. Yes. Thank you so much, Nicole. And uh, we have here another question from the floor. Uh, PGIs can file, and as we have seen, EFA via GA in view. Does this mean that Scots Whiskey Association will be able to file this in the future and it will be enough to stop the fake product at the external EU borders? So, for Nicole, too. <laughs> Um, GIs are GIs, so um, like I said, it could be a tequila from Mexico, it could be uh, whatever else out there, if it's registered, it can be protected, and we're looking at EU, for EU enforcement, the EU enforcement in the, in the member states, so yeah, uh, same thing goes. I, I think the problem uh, is that you can provide the information on a portal like that, but um, a customs officer on the ground still needs to know how to spot it either through documents um, or um, even examining some of the samples for him or herself uh, in terms of what the bottle or, or product labeling looks like. That's quite a tall order because, um, for example, a, a fake bottle of Scotch whiskey might have a, a lower than normal fill level or the label isn't very straight or there's a spelling error on it. Um, for example, whiskey spelled with the E for Scotch whisky rather than without the E um, it would be a, a, an obvious spelling error uh, for, for our GI. Um, but to get that kind of training across re requires quite a bit of effort. Um, and, and, and the portal will certainly be a step forward uh, for that. Um, but uh, I think there needs to be significantly more training uh, across uh, the, the customs network for the EU in terms of, of um, uh, how to spot um, the, the problem products that, that are uh, a target for, for the EU. If I may, yes. I mean, it's also, it happens also for, 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 for trademarks and other infringing goods. I mean, packaging and all these hints are, are very often the key to, 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 to for, for border officials to stop things. It's, it's less a product that needs to be sent to a lab than, than the packaging that can be spotted. Yeah, by all means, yeah. Can I in, can I intervene to give a, to to give you a piece of my past experience on uh, such on border controls together with your force? Of course, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before the before uh, before leaving before leaving Italy for uh, for uh, Georgia for my new second job. Um, on behalf of, of my of uh, my administration, I coordinated a very uh, wide control actions against a fake prosecco uh, coming from Ukraine. We were uh, we were informed by the um, border by the, by the Bulgarian border authority about possible infringement regarding. Uh, Prosecco wine, because, because, and this is very, very important, because our Prosecco producer groups uh, informed uh, the European uh, Union network of uh, uh, customs agencies uh, uh, through, uh, through using uh, the regulation 608 of 2030. Um, uh, on the main requirements uh, regarding the labeling of the through pro, pro uh, seco. thanks to uh, these, we were we were able in just three days, three uh, days, to coordinate at EU level an action which involved four customs agency and fifteen. 15 um, enforcement authorities. And we were able to get rid of of, of, of hundreds of tons of fake Ukrainian Prosecco. So this is a, a clear example on how it's so important to have 
a strong and strengthened coordination between all the, the actors involved in GI protection. Can I add uh, something there, Pilar? Uh, I entirely agree with Bartok. Yes, yes, yes. Of course, thank you. thank you very much, Alan. Okay, thank you, Pilar. Um, I entirely agree with Bartolo Mayo in, in terms of that, that sharing and coordination, but one of the challenges for producer groups is the lack of information sharing from enforcement authorities. Um, it might be because of uh, data protection rules or, or um, ideas around commercial confidentiality. Uh, but when we sometimes seek information from enforcement authorities across the EU as to uh, routes of supply, uh, information about a, a distributor that we think is suspicious and so on, um, we think the enforcement authorities will take action, but they won't necessarily tell us what they're doing, what progress they're making, and whether we need to be taking our own parallel action. Uh, and so there's some issues around information sharing we'd like to see resolved that may be blocked by uh, an EU regulatory framework that prevents that kind of information sharing with private producer groups. But I think that's a significant problem. Thank you, Alan. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have the uh, uh, last question from uh, David Tual. I will read it to you. Control and enforcement measures are based of, on the extent of the protection given to GIs. How can we ensure that control authorities and judges know and take into account the rulings and jurisprudence of the European Union Court of Justice? Mm -hmm. Perhaps oh, it's true that uh, just a minute, just a minute, as, as I know, it's a, a very <laughs> important and big question. We can say something now if, uh, if you agree. And tomorrow, as you know, we will have a follow up of this uh, session. We can continue our debate. So please, uh, Bartolomeo. I don't know. Just, uh, just to give, just to, just to give my point of view because uh, when um, when started working uh, in uh, that field in in the GI field, I of course di discovered uh, a very important uh, uh, difficult uh, um, difficult point to uh, to have. Good uh, a good information regarding, for example, uh, um, in, for example, product specifications uh, of other member states or other uh, or or uh, third countries uh, regarding the um, EU part of justice case laws and so on and uh, and uh, and uh, so forth. So. I can only give you a, a very important um, suggestion. Please cooperate with the other enforcement authorities, with the other EU authorities, with the producer groups, and inquire, ask for information to the universities in the European Union, mainly involved in GI issues. Uh, because uh, tackling GI infringements is a matter of coordinating action between private and public actors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bartolomeo. I think it, it's a very important issue and you have uh, said, uh, you have shown in a, in a very nice way. I have, it's, I, I know it's a bit because we have uh, other question, but perhaps we can uh, continue this debate tomorrow in the, in the second panel regarding enforcement and controls. I will keenly ask you to, to follow this debate tomorrow. And only to conclude this panel, I think uh, we have seen this morning from all you, the specialized speaker we have this morning with us, the main challenge faced by GI regarding control and enforcement. I think we, we can uh, congratulate the European Commission, UAPO, and all the uh, different institutions because it's a very big issue. We need to really take uh, in hand and to uh, provide perhaps new ideas. And it's for that reason that we have uh, had this conference. And perhaps I would like to highlight the importance, uh, of, if I can summarize, of mo modernizing the, the enforcement procedures as we have seen to allow better protection, simple protection, to empower producer groups as we, has, we have seen with Alan to support them. 
and also to increase the transparency of GIs connecting all the producer and enforcement and anti-fraud fraud, uh, bodies. And here I, uh, we have seen with Bartolomeo and Nicole the importance of this coordination. And I, I would like to say that GIs deserve this effort because, as I have said at the beginning, their infringement are more detrimental than other IP infringement. And they are damaging an added value gain across generation. Basically, they undermine cultural heritage. And even though if we can't forget the necessity of uh, make a balance, as Dev Ganji has said at the beginning, between unfair competition and IP rights, we need to find this balance for geographical indication because they deserved it. To conclude, I would like to thank all the participants, the attendants from all around the world, the speakers, the organizers, and our pilot officer, Ola Cebowska. Thank you, you for all the, your great help and see you in the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you to, to everyone. Goodbye. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank for you. Speaking. Bye. Bye, thank you, Pilar. Bye, thank you to all of you. Thank you, thank you very much. It was. Thank you, thank you. Thanks.